Hi guys, welcome back to Cupcakes and Protein Shakes. So this is one of my favorite episodes. It's called Bikini Girl Chit Chat. So it's myself and another bikini girl and we're gonna chit chat about um, their journey. So introduce yourself, your name, your age and where are you from? Oops, I'm so sorry. My dog is jumping on me. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I got mine right next to me as well. Um, I'm Kylie. I am from the Bay Area in California and this is Mr. Pita. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm currently living in Sacramento. Uh, what, kind so still NorCal. Yeah. what kind of dog do you have? Um, well, he's a rescue, so we're not entirely sure, okay. but he's like maybe mini terrier, a little bit of pug, a little bit of dachshund perhaps. But yeah. yeah. He's super cute. Him. I have my dog is literally sitting on the floor, but they're old. Thin. I have my lab husky and my, my black lab and he's my lab black lab. He's a rescue too. So we're not exactly sure. We think he's a lab, but something else mm -hmm. in there. Um, oh. but anyway, so let's go with to your fitness journey. So when did you start competing and, um, when was your first show? Um, so I started competing and had my first show in 2017. Um, I had been lifting for a few years, but I didn't get really consistent until maybe like 2016 or 2015, I guess you could say, um, did I, did I hit everything for show? Yeah. yeah was, okay. So up until now, um, walk me through how many shows that you've done. So we did our first show, you said 26, 17, 2017. Okay. Yeah. So that was my first show. I just did one in 2017 in 2018. I did four. Oh, geez. That's, okay. That's five. And then 2019, I did four again. Oh my gosh. 2020, I believe was also another four. So that's up to 13. Oh 2021 gosh. was three. So that would be 16, I think. That's a lot of yeah, shows. Yeah, it is quite a bit. Um, oh my gosh. Okay. Yes. So <laughs> yeah. it's safe to say that you're not, you're like myself. So we're like pro amateurs is kind of what I'm thinking. I would say so. Last year I was on the brink of my pro card this freaking close. So really gunning for it this year. Got a chip on my shoulder. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm excited to talk to you about that. Okay. So let's go backwards. So what was your most recent show? Um, my last show was North Americans in, I believe that was the first week of September. Okay. Um, and that was yeah. 2021 North Americans. Yeah. 2021. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. That was a big I show too. With USA's and that's when I got, I was two places shy of my pro card. So, you know, I was going to North Americans like, ah, like I'm right there. So. Yeah. yeah you were very, very, very close. So <laughs> let's go back to that feeling of, when you're preparing for this prep, was there anything different about the last prep compared to all your past ones? Um, honestly, I think every prep is really different. And yeah. I think that's something competitors just come to learn over time. Um, as much as you're learning your body and like some, you know, more or less your body responds similarly time after time, but it also does change with, you know, it's different amongst different individuals. Everyone's different, but also with, within ourselves, like, and some are harder, some are easier. It just, it really depends on all the, you know, the outside circumstances too. Um, okay. Who are you coached by and have you been coached by the same person the whole time? Um, so starting back at the beginning, I guess, um, I was self-coached for my okay. first five shows. Um, wow. and the reason I started in the first place, I, I was a coach, not for, you know, um, NPC, like competition preps or anything, just like lifestyle fitness. And okay. I was really, um, I just was really in love with bodybuilding. And so clients and friends and were just like, you know, you should try competing. Have you ever thought of that? Like this month, like, Ooh, I don't know. Cause I'm personally, I'm like fairly modest and like going on stage, like naked, like that, you know, that was just totally beyond me. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to try it. I'm going to push myself, see what I'm made of, see what I can do. And, um, after that first show, um, being self-coached and I took home third and I was just like floored, like, wow, like imagine like if I could, you know, do this on my own, what else am I capable of? You know, yeah. I'm sure you can probably relate. Like the first time you compete, yeah. that's kind of when, you know, like you're either hooked or, yeah. you know, it's not for you. Yeah. I think um, you clearly know after the first show, you know, if yeah. there's, if you are not in love with it after your first one, you probably should just stop. Cause it's not, it's, I, don't, I, I think it gets better if you love it, like as it goes on, but if you really don't like it at all, it's not, 
I don't know. It maybe it's a learned thing, but that's just my opinion. Yeah. Like I fell in love with it the first time. Exactly. I, I don't know a lot of people that stay in it long term that were like, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't for me. It's like it's so niche and it's so many mm-hmm. like weird things that go into it. And it's like very exactly. hard, you know. Yeah. And I feel like no matter how much you prepare, even you know, with a coach for your first yeah. show, you never really fully understand until you're actually in it, like what it's like, you know, the tanning and you know, all all these like nuances and complex little processes behind the scenes that people on the outside or new competitors really just don't understand. So I really do feel like there's no gray area after that first show. It's either like, damn, I'm here. Like, let's keep going. I want to beat my best. Or it's like, oh, that was not it. So, so that's where I started. And, um, in 2018, I did all four of those shows self-coached as well. Um, kind of regrettably, I just, Um, even, I think that even if you have the knowledge, I know there are some competitors who, you know, pro level or continue to self-coach. I just, you need that second set of eyes, no matter what, because it's more of a mental game than anything else. And I'm sure you can attest to that yourself and just, you know, knowing when to pull back versus not. And I think there's a lot of us, like you have to have a kind of addictive personality to excel in the sport in the first place. So I think a lot of us would more so run ourselves into the ground, like, oh, I need to do more cardio. I need to eat less. And just, so I kind of went on that path in 2018 and, you know, prep goggles, I didn't see, like, I, I caused health issues, like exacerbated, you know, existing health issues for my youth. And just, it was not good. I, I could show you some pictures. I just looked very skinny. I don't look healthy. And it was, it was bad. And so that was the point when I knew I'm like, okay, like I, because I want to take this seriously and want to continue competing, like I need to get a coach. So that's when I, you know, started researching and I, um, found, uh, Michelle Hurst, who, um, she's an IFBB pro, uh, team handsome muscle. So that's when I started, um, joined the team and I've been with them other ever since. So. Yeah, actually we work with them quite a bit. We love yeah. their team and they're super awesome. So, you and know. we love angel. I, yeah, I know. So it's just such a small world in the competing. It's, it so, is. it's so crazy, but, um, it's, so what do you do for work? You said you're a coach full-time. Was it always that way? No, I, I was always coaching sort of like as a side thing and okay. despite, you know, being encouraged to take it full-time. And I think you know, in that 2017, 2018 era, that was a huge trend to like, oh, ditch your full-time job to become a full-time coach or like a fitness influencer on Instagram and YouTube and all that. And it's yeah. just like, for me, while it's a passion, it's not something I would want to pursue as like my sole full-time thing. So um, yeah. I am full-time, I'm a project manager for marketing communications um, okay. at Silicon Valley Community Foundation. And it's something I really am passionate about it. Um, and it's just, you know, a lot to balance with competing and all everything else. <laughs> so speaking of balance, I think that could be really insightful because you are, you know, working a lot, you know, you have part, the part-time, you have competing, mm-hmm. which technically is another I consider it a full-time job, Oh, yeah, you know, definitely. and then Time also job. like your, your nine to five or whatever keeps, you know, mm-hmm. keeps you being able to keep competing. So how do yeah. you balance your time? Um, I, I, in a simple answer would just be like scheduling every minute to the T. But, um, cause when I, when I started competing, I was actually still, um, I was in college and I had, uh, two different, Uh, jobs that were almost full-time and then other like side hustles on top of that I was just doing I had like more than four jobs and I was preparing for my first show by myself so I just it was no time at all so it's like really having that time management scheduling everything out and just like when it's grind time you just go sometimes it's like I I don't know how I got through this many months you know um yeah what is like a typical day in your life look like that's, that's also hard to say. I mean, right now I'm also working from home pretty much exclusively. Um, we've had a lot of fluctuations, of course, with COVID-19 and like going back and forth to our office. Yeah. Um, so, and right now with my sort of workload, I'm just, 
if I'm not working my day job, I'm probably working out, eating or sleeping or meal prepping. Uh, and that's yeah. kind of like, so it, it's just, yeah, a lot of back and forth. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone who says that they don't have time to like meal prep or they don't have time to work out? I think, I think it's just a sad excuse. I think everyone has the time for things that they want to make a priority. Yeah. And if it's, I know, you know, it's not financially feasible for everyone to, you know, hire a meal prep service, yeah. but you know, if you set aside the time to meal prep yourself, you're actually saving quite a bit of money, like chicken breast, you can get a couple dollars a pound. Um, I, I really just think it's a poor excuse. Um, Me too. And, and something I always encourage like my clients to do personally is just start very, very small, like, yeah. because, you know, everyone starts with new year, new me, like I'm going to go to the gym five days a week and this and that. And I'm, when I say, no, you're not, I'm not mm -hmm. doubting you. I'm just yeah. saying like, maybe you'll do it a few weeks, but if it's, you know, so yeah. new to your lifestyle, you're not going to be able to keep it up. Um, so I honestly, I'll start with like a couple days a week and like, the bare minimum of everything, because then when you build on that success, that's when you're able to see, you know, you gain that momentum, which I would say is far more important than being motivated. Mm -hmm. um, like, I don't know, they kind of go hand in hand. So, you yeah. know, if a client is able to go to the gym three days a week for a few weeks and, you know, get that confidence boost and it's like, okay, maybe I can add another day yeah. versus, you know, if you bite off more than you can chew, it's not going to work out. Yeah, I agree. Like, especially this time of year, I've had, I, I do have a couple of people floating in my DMS of like, I'm going to start working out seven days a week and I'm going to do all this stuff. I was like, wow, uh -huh. I don't even do that. Like, good luck. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, I wish everyone the best, but you know, I like bodybuilding because mm -hmm. it teaches you that like per progressively over a long period of time. And I think because of like how many shows that you've done, like you've been sh like consistency uh, and mm -hmm. just putting the work in and putting the time in and showing up, show after show after show that you'll eventually get that result, but it just kind of builds on itself. But you do have to kind of start slow to get to the end goal. Um, when you are looking back at like what you used to do versus what you are doing now in your prep, what were some things you wish you could have went back and changed, whether it's training or diet from the beginning? Oh, that's a really good one. Um, I feel like, I mean, bottom line, I definitely wish I hired a coach sooner Yeah, and didn't just kind of like keep going and spinning my wheels because that definitely, like I lost a lot of muscle mass and yeah. Even though, you know, there's um, muscle memory, it's a little easier to get back than to start from scratch. It really is. I think that really took a toll on me mentally, um, have being like, well, <laughs> I did this to myself, like I ruined all my progress and, you know, now I have to, you know, make back all that lost time. Um, other things I would have done differently. I think um, overtraining was a big part of it. Like not taking my rest days because you always think like more is more, more is more. And a lot of the time it's less is more, you know, quality over quantity. Um, and I know that's also a pretty common, like faux pas for competitors is because there's mm -hmm. just like, you think, oh, there's not enough time. Got to work out. But if you don't give your muscles the time to recover, they're not going to grow. Yeah. Um, I like that. Okay. Yeah. What was your last feedback? Um, I'm basically working a little bit on my upper glutes and then definitely on my shoulders. I think that's like the most consistent feedback I have gotten is like, I've gotten my glutes basically where they need to be, but, um, upper body need to, you know, get that symmetry and balance. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about creating, going through like different looks. Have you always had like the same stage look as far as like suit and overall like posing presentation like have you felt like you're really close to like nailing your stage look um I th I think that's one of the biggest differences from last year especially is that like it's like night and day like I've definitely my coach and I especially have been really you know fine-tuning the look and the posing and you know figuring out what works best I'm honestly embarrassed at like my suit choices from like my first two years, just like, Oh God, that's, you know, and I know that the style and trends have trained or evolved, you know, gradually yeah. over time, definitely since 2017. I think that's when you started competing too, right? Yeah. My first, yeah. first show was 2017, like 
the low rise connectors. Yes. Yeah. And like the dangles and stuff. Yeah. Like, oh, it's, it's, it is. And like looking yeah. at back, like, please someone just go back in time and like pull those connectors up, please. Right. Oh God. Just like the whole low rise jeans. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, aside from, you know, the whole sport just evolving, like I, it's also a lot of like personal, like figuring out what looks best on yourself and yeah. whether it's color and hairstyle and things like that. Um, it's definitely um, been a work in progress. And in terms of posing, that has always been like my hardest part. Yeah. Always. And I used to hate practicing because for me, I just, I wouldn't consider myself like a very glitzy, glamoury, like I'm not, you know, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I practiced a lot and it was just, it was really difficult. I, even in my first couple of years, I just feel like a, like a little deer with like little deer legs stumbling around on stage, you know, uh -huh. but, um, I think last year was where I like really drilled it. It was, um, after USA's, uh, 2020, I think, or earlier, maybe leading up to USA's when I just was really like, I was like, I'm going to practice like multiple times a day, every day. I was actually, no, no, no. It was, um, after 2019, because I remember the pandemic, you know, it yeah. hit March, 2020. And I was already like, I was posing multiple times a day, even in my improvement season. Cause I was like, you know what, I'm not going to get anywhere if I'm just kind of like klutzing around. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, last year, I feel like I really honed in on a routine and it's just kind of like tweaking things along the way. And something that really fascinates me about posing is just how much, um, you will change your posing depending on your physique. Yeah. So it's like before in years prior, I couldn't even, I could hardly get my routine down in a graceful manner, you know? Right. But then once you have that at that level, that's when you can start making those little tweaks here and there to, you know, showcase your physique in the best way. For example, like 2020, I was had to stick my arms so hard to get my lat to pop out. Whereas I'm trying to do that last year. And my coach was like, just rest your arm. Like your lats are jacked now. Like you don't need to be posing so hard in that way. I'm like, you're right. Yeah. So it's just, it's interesting how it's like, it will always continue to evolve. And like, there's never, you know, one size fits all. And there's never, you know, it's never going to be the same for even, you know, yourself time after time. So. Did you have like any type of sports background or dance background or anything when you were growing up? Um, I, I played like every sport imaginable. I was very much a little tomboy and into all the sports, like getting dirty in the mud, football, soccer, sign me up. But I was just never very good at that. Um, dance, same. I did a lot of different kinds of dance growing up. Yeah. I wasn't good at it. I just yeah. was very graceful. A little, I was a little clown, I guess you could say. But, um, and then, you know, over time, like I, I tried basketball in middle school and high school and volleyball. That was probably like the main sport I was into, but I just, I still wasn't there. And I'm, yeah. I'm five, two and a half. So I'm really short. Oh, Basketball is yeah. probably not the best one for me. <laughs> and I just, I didn't have enough grit with those. So yeah. I, you know. Okay. Well, okay. So that's, I mean, that's kind of interesting to me because, um, I feel like there's two types of competitors. There's like the competitors that were super, super overly athletic. And so the transition from, you know, whatever sports they used to play to this was like organic mm -hmm. and it just made sense. They're like, I'm looking for something outside of it. And then yeah. I feel like there there's other competitors like yourself of like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you were athletic, but it weren't, it wasn't something that you excelled at or that you wanted to. Uh -huh. And it just yeah. like, be because of like, you probably grew your like for this sport, like, and like for training. And I, I think sometimes it's as you get older too, like, I wish I would have had the same worth ethic now back then, because yeah. who knows what kind of athletes we might've been, you know, back in the day, if we would have applied, right. it's just so weird how it kind of works mm -hmm. itself out of like, okay. I mean, I wasn't taking my sports that serious. It was just yeah. like something to do because your friends are doing it. And, uh, you know, I was okay. I was uh -huh. always like a mediocre athlete. I wouldn't, I wasn't like 
the all-star person. I wasn't making newspaper articles yeah. or anything. It's just like, I was on the team. I wasn't the worst, wasn't the best, just somewhere mm-hmm. in between. Um, Participation trophy. <laughs> exactly. And so now it's been really interesting to take that like competitive level in this sport. And like, mm-hmm. I feel like it's a lot more fun now because I don't know, it's, it's not a team sport and it's like direct correlation of like my work ethic shows up in my placing and my posing. And so I think that's something that's pretty intriguing because, you know, basketball, volleyball, those are like team sports. Mm -hmm. This is like one of the first sports that I've ever done. That was like an individual one. And I think it clicks better that way because, you know, it's all on you. Exactly. And I feel the same way. And I've noticed similar trends in like, you know, people's backgrounds, but like as an adult, I, I had a phase where I was into running a lot, which is hilarious to me now because I, I, I don't like cardio. I just don't freaking like cardio. Um, and then, you know, I got into lifting. I had a little bit of a power building and power lifting phase before I like nestled into bodybuilding. But, you know, to your point, I really think, um, because you have to be a gritty person to be able to be successful and to continue in this sport. And for me, I, you know, think back, like why people like you and I, like when we did have those backgrounds, like what was it that didn't have that connection before? And it's honestly, I think it's finding what aligns with you because, you know, I was in my youth, I like, I would like to say in terms of sports, I was a wuss because like, I would just, I'd be discouraged and stuff when I didn't do well. And I just be like, whatever. And, you know, okay, I'm quit the team or, you know, Um, but, you know, in academics and other, you know, sort of passions, I was still like very gritty. So I really think it's about finding what line uh, aligns with you. So if it is the individual sport, you know, like it was for us, that's when you find it. That's when it clicks. That's when you can push yourself to not give up because, it's also very easy to give up in bodybuilding too, especially because you're alone. Like no one's, you know, no one's following you around. Like, even if you have a coach, like they're not there to babysit you and be like, did you do your cardio? Did you do your training? Oh, did you have an extra rice cake on top of your meal plan? Like, you know, it's on you. So you either sink or swim. Has there ever been a time that you've wanted to quit the sport completely? I think at, um, after USA's 2020, um, that was the end of my 2020 season. And it was really weird because, you know, it was heavy pandemic year and uh, USA's was moved to December instead of summer when it typically is. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, cold winter seasonal depression. And um, like my, the county I was living in had just gone back into like a lockdown. And so it just kind of, I felt like it hit me all of a sudden. I also, I had a strong competition season that year, but then that was one of my worst placings that, uh, that yeah, USA's 2020. And I started getting in my head and wondering like, what if this isn't for me? You know, and you just kind of like have that, like sit with that. Um, and there was nothing, you know, that really inspired that. I mean, just, because you don't place well, like that really is no reason because even no matter how hard you work, I mean, the placing is all subjective and, you know, everyone else is working just as hard as you are at that level. So I definitely had to sit with some weird mental feelings of like questioning myself and questioning, like, do I have what it takes? I think that that was the first time, um, I think in years also that I had like screwed up on my meal plan. I'm hardcore perfectionist. So like any thing like that, like really weighs on me. I remember telling my coach and I was crying that like, um, and she was like, you know, like it's, it happens. It's not a big deal. Yeah. And I just, for me, it was just like, oh my God, does this mean I'm not cut out for it? But, um, I mean, I came around and I, and that's the time when I did end up just being like, okay, like nothing's going to be off. Everything is going to be serious. Like, you know, mm-hmm. And how many national shows have you done so far? Ooh, more than I would like to. <laughs> right. Um, so I did my first national show was USA's 2019. Um, and my coach and I knew that I was not ready. Like I was, you know, to 
I was not pro card worthy at that point. Yeah. But um, we had made that conscious decision to do it just to get my feet wet, see what a yeah. national show was like, because it really is. It's different. Night and day from oh. a regional show. And that's feel, another thing. Yeah, like when I, when you, if you're listening to this and you're like, it's my first year, I'm going to do nationals. Just like, are you sure you want to do that? Are you sure? Because it's humbling. Because I didn't understand the sport until you go to nationals, until you see them in person. So I'll, I'll let you continue, but I felt the yeah. same way. Oh, definitely. It's, it's, it, it really is night and day. And, you know, all these competitors, like new competitors start competing and think they're going to go pro. And I do know some anomalies I'm actually yeah. close with overall in their first show and then went pro at, at nationals on their second. But it's just like there, I also know many people and, you know, some close friends who have hit, like been in the top call out for like 10 national shows yeah. and they still are not in the IMBB. And it's just like, you have have to have that it goes back to the grit and keep showing up uh, um anyway to your original question so 2019 usa's first national show we knew i was not ready but it was about getting that experience and seeing what it was like i'm pretty i tied for dead last i believe out of like 40 girls and that's you know 16 uh, <laughs> you got 16 16 yeah oh yeah 16 even though there was 40 yeah you know? we all got we 16 all, <laughs> yeah yeah. Oh gosh. But anyway, so I did that and I did North Americans that year too. And almost regrettably, because like, it was clear, like I just had so much more building to do. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so that's two 2020. I also did two. No. 2020. I only did one national show. That's three, I think five now. Okay. But yeah. So yeah. We'll see. <laughs> you're close I mean it, it does take a lot I know someone who's done nine I think and it's it's hard for me like I feel emotion towards competitors that have been working so hard because I'm like I'm right there with you like I'm just starting mine and you know just like seeing like athletes just keep keep coming back and yeah. you know it's it is hard to get on stage to know that you your best is still not worthy. It's really hard to put that in that feeling into perspective until you're on stage getting the place mm -hmm. because like you can work your hardest and you can look your best, but guess what? <laughs> everyone next to you is the same way. Like exactly. everyone next to you is doing the same thing. And so yeah. when you're standing on that national stage and you don't hear your number called, it's like a heart sinking feeling of like, wow, I'm, I have to, like, I have, you, you literally have to, in that moment, it's just like you flash back to everything that was up until this point. Was it worth it? Do I still want to be mm -hmm. in this sport? I wasted time. I wasted money. Like, am I okay with how I present it? It's like, and I'm still not there. It's like, how much further can I push myself? And it's hard. Like you really have to kind of sit with it and just be like, how bad do I want this? Cause if this is not something that you're serious about, can you go through this again? four, five, five, six, seven, eight, however many times it takes to get that top spot. Yeah, definitely. I, it really, in any, any, any show, any national show really is humbling. Just being backstage and seeing it's like, you know, like we both agreed, like it is not a testament to your hard work because no. everyone there worked just as hard, Yeah, uh, you know, and you know, everyone there, it's their best. And like, you know, when you're at this level, you're in, you know, on the brink of your pro card, you're paying attention to the national sh circuit, like the whole year I'm, C I'm in C class. So it's like, yep. I see, you know, last year, I'm like, I see who's in that top call out at junior USA's junior nationals, like whoever isn't in their pro card, they're going to be up there with me, you know, yes. like I, we're, those, we're the same wave. Like I'm watching, like, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm the tallest class, which is always uh, I'm H. So I'm like always looking at those girls and I'm like, all right, Everyone who got third through 40th is coming back. We're battling next year. Exactly. I was like, that's what's going to happen. And so mm -hmm. like you, you pay attention to them and, you know, it's hard for competitors not to compare yourself because this is mm -hmm. a literal game of comparison compared yeah. to 40 other mm -hmm. athletes. Who's the best. And that mm -hmm. can be different every time. Best is not hardest working. Best is not who looks the prettiest best is not yeah. leanest best is not most muscular it is just best that mm -hmm. day and that is not exactly. the, pet. the judges can say we like this girl you know 
it's apples today, tomorrow mm, it's oranges. Like it's really, really hard because you yeah. know, if you're off by a little bit, you're in last call outs. Like exactly. if you're off, you have to be on and then have a little bit of luck and then keep, they have to recognize you. You have to show up. So and, much luck. It's so much luck. I mean, yeah, people don't really realize. And just like yeah. the posing too is like literally everything. If you can't pose somewhat, yeah. like you could have the best physique by far, but if you're, if your presentation isn't on point, if you don't know how to show it, yeah, it it's not going to Yeah. And it also, it is like who shows up on that day. If, you know, the top physiques in your class are on the more muscular side and you're not, you're not going to do as well, even though, you know, what, whichever way things are trending and, you know, the NPC and IFBB as a whole, it's still, it's like who shows up that day too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And that's, so if you're like listening to this and I struggled at the beginning of my journey with placement with like putting my worth into placement in comparison to other competitors. So after a show, when you do, you get a favorable or unfavorable placing, how do you handle it? Like post-show, what goes through your mind once you've been placed? Oh, that's a good question. Cause I remember my, so my warm up show for USA is last year. It was uh, Patriots in Vegas and I got fourth and I was mad. (laughs) I was sad. (laughs) Just for the beginning though, just in the beginning, I think we're always going to have that instant reaction that we can't control before we all of, you know, before we take a moment to process. And like, I just, I think we, we hold ourselves to such a high standard, you know? And, um, you know, I was there with, you know, some of my closest girlfriends who are competitors were competing with me there too. And they were also just like, whoa, what the fuck for Like you, like, I thought you were going to get first or second. And I think that's why for me, like, I remember it was looking like I was either going to be first or second. So I think that's when the initial, like, Hey, wait a minute. But obviously like, that's something to be proud of. Fourth is, fourth is not bad. Yeah. You know? So it's Uh like, you take that moment to calm down and be like, okay, yes. Like I did a good job. I'm proud, but then, you know, you look and see, it's like, okay, so what were the differences? Where should I improve? Oh, okay. That girl, her, you know, she had fuller upper glutes. I think that's exactly what it was actually. Yeah. And, you know, um, I'm not going to say her name. I remember who it was, but she, she ended up going pro at USA's. Um, she, yeah, she, she won my class. She won the overall, and then she went pro at USA's. Yeah. Um, but it's just like, what any given day, you know? Um, so your original question, it was, um, how do you react to placing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, yeah, I think that's a pretty reasonable blanket statement. It's like, you're going to have an initial reaction that you don't really have control over whether it's, you know, joy or despair, Right. but then, you know, you really have to just be rational, like consider all things considered, like fourth is wonderful. So, um, and then, But when I, um, the USA's this year, when I came that close to my pro card, that was just, that was shock. I don't, I, I don't know how I just stayed smiling on stage the whole time when they're, you know, doing comparisons and stuff, because I feel like my face, like in my head, it looks like, (laughs) you know, yeah, it's overwhelming. Yeah. So when they called your number for like the the top call outs, like what, what were you thinking? Um, well, it was, that show was just such a good experience for me last year. Cause I remember before, you know, when I was backstage about to go on, I just had this overwhelming sense of like, all of a sudden this rush over me that felt like, I felt like I belonged there for the first time, like in previous years, you know, as I mentioned, like my first year, I was like, I know I'm not ready. I'm, you know, I have other reasons to be here. I, this is just to get the experience, just to get my feet wet. But then I, even though I had a, f- a few national shows in a right belt, it was USA's last year that I was just, I was on the side of the stage and I was like looking around looking at the audience looking at the girls on stage. And I was like, I really belong here. And I was like, tear, I, tears came to my eyes. I'm kind of a, an emotional person in some ways. Um, and I was like, no, 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 you're going to mess, mess up your makeup before you go on. But um, I just, I don't know. I, I had that overwhelming sense of pride. And when, um, I was called in the first call out, like I just, 
my mind went blank. I didn't have any thoughts. I was just like, wow, like this, I'm here in the first call out. And it was weird because normally, you know, they have you switching places and stuff, but they just, they weren't moving us. They just have them back and forth, like face the back, face the front. I was like, oh my God, why aren't they moving me? Where am I? I'm like, I know I'm not on the ends. I feel like I'm pretty close to the middle. Cause you know, when you're up there and like, you don't know where you are and you're not going to be like, like yeah. looking around like a dumbass. Mm-hmm. Like, so yeah. that feeling, I was just like, where am I? What's going on? And um, yeah, just like total shock. Awesome. Total shock. That's yeah. Awesome. Well, in between finals and pre-judging, what did you think? What do you do in between that time? Um, well, national shows give me a lot more anxiety since it's like two days generally rather yeah. than back to back. Um, and so it's just kind of like trying to relax. Mm. Usually um, I room with like at least like one or two other like teammates who I'm also really close with. Some of my best friends are on my team, which is just makes the experience that much better. So it's, so in between, usually we'll relax. Typically, if we're lucky, we're assigned a burger in between, you know, you're always like, oh, do I get to eat something substantial yeah. <laughs> set of air, right? <laughs> cake? Do I get to drink any water? Um, so it's just kind of like hanging out and, you know, calming each other down and, you know, just getting out any anxiety and like distress. Um, cause I think a lot of us, um, will come back kind of like, it looks like I was, you know, or if you weren't in the first call out and stuff, you know, you just have that, that initial reaction, like we were talking about before, if you don't yeah. you're interested all of a sudden, <laughs> um, yeah. So just kind of like trying to decompress and stay calm and just bring that same A game to finals. Do you get any stage fright before you go on? Um, I think, you know, for my first competition, but not as much anymore. It's cause it's just like, it's going to be the same thing. And I always just remind myself, like, this is the chance to showcase my hard work. Yeah. Um, I had a background in theater too, so I'm not okay. as afraid of like being in front of a crowd or anything. It was just, and I remember before my first one, I was just like, this is like, I'm going to be terrified because like, I'm going to be naked on stage like what the hell this is a departure from my character but (laughs) yeah so yeah okay I think that's interesting yeah because like I don't even think of it as sexualized anymore oh yeah definitely like I don't even it's so and I don't I think it made me see bodies differently like I see girls I don't know and I look I don't see I don't see but I see glutes. I was like, look exactly. at her glute. Like, I look at her hamstring. Exactly. Look at her tie in. It's not like, look at them legs or like, look at her teeny little waist. It's like, oh, look at her conditioning, her core, and look at her, her X frame and her shoulders. Exactly. And it's, yeah. it's so to the, to us, we're so trained to like just mm-hmm. look for the anatomical muscle structure. Uh, mm-hmm. I think, I don't know. There's like, you know, the general population that might think it's like more than that. Cause you are yeah. in a teeny little tiny bikini. Was there anyone in your life that you had to explain what you were doing to like that they didn't understand it or like, how did friends mm-hmm. and family react when you decided and you're like, Hey, I'm, I'm doing this now. Yeah. Cause I think to your point, like there are some people outside the sport who might sexualize it. And I mean, I don't see it that way. And I never had before. It's just like, for me being so modest, like, even though I know it's like, this is just a presentation of my hard work for me. It's just like, give me a towel. (laughs) But I mean, obviously, you know, you get used to it pretty quickly. And I think, um, um, in terms of like family reactions and stuff, they're also, you know, on the modest side. And so at first it was also, you know, a very big shock to them. Um, but I think they were also pretty quick to get used to it. And like, once they had seen like that, this was like, this was a path for me. It wasn't a hobby. It wasn't a temporary passion. It wasn't like a bucket list item as it is for some people. Like this is a trajectory Yeah. Um, and they have come to, you know, celebrate it and be so proud. Um, you know, they did a, I think in the first couple of years, um, my mother especially would have, you know, a lot of concern because, you know, like, oh, not healthy, like 
you know, yeah. and at that point I wasn't like, I, you know, was getting really frail and just too thin, too low body fat. So like for her, she was always just like checking, like concerned about my health. But once she could see, it was like, this is, this is a path for me. She, you know, became to be more celebratory. Yeah. I think, yeah, it, yeah, it is. Cause some, I mean, there are some that do one and dones, but, um, mm-hmm. once it, you do it for a long term, it just becomes like who you are. And this is like how yeah. you are living now. And so it does take some time mm-hmm. for, you know, the commoners to, um, um, adjust to your lifestyle. That's pretty extreme, you know? Yeah. I, I definitely feel the same way. And even, I mean, prior to competing, I was the type who would like bring my meal prep around and stuff. And all my friends were all, you know, very much used to that. And to this day, like, I don't have anyone who, you know, is like, oh, you brought your Tupperware to a restaurant. I mean, it became a little different during the pandemic because of like yeah. health concerns and all that. But I mean, like, it's very normal for, you know, me to bring Tupperware to a restaurant or to go and not eat. Like, I think there's the misconception, like prep doesn't mean you have to miss out on things. I mean, yes, there will be points when you definitely want to preserve your energy and, you know, forego social activities or late night things. Um, but, um, you know, for folks who are afraid of, you know, what people will think if they, you know, want to bring their Tupperware to go out and things like that. Um, if you have the right friends, doesn't matter if they're in the sport or not, they will still, you know, respect you and respect that that's, you know, part of who you are. And I think that's a lot of, um, a lot of younger competitors might struggle with that more because they're likely to be, you know, more concerned with their image and their social life or social status or whatever, you know, the case may be, but yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it's like, as I've aged with the sport, it's so much easier. Cause like mm-hmm. when I was younger, I was in my young twenties, um, mm-hmm. early twenties. And then as I got older, it just like I don't know. It didn't seem a big deal. Like at first, you know, saying no to the bar hopping and the mm-hmm. meal times out, but then, you know, everyone kind of ages and, and naturally it's like, it's not mm-hmm. as a big deal. Like people aren't partying now. So it's more, exactly. common. Like, like yeah. a lot of my friends are, are moms or have kids. And so like, they are, you know, we all go to bed early. We have to get up early. So it's <laughs> exactly. like, okay, yeah. this works out really nicely. Cause we, mm-hmm. you know, we all have similar um, differences. But mm-hmm. from all of your preps, which one was your favorite? Ooh, that is such a good question. Honestly, I want to say my prep for Patriots last year because I just, I feel like that's when I saw, started seeing like the biggest transformation, not just in my physique, but in posing and everything and just really feeling like, like this is my time and feeling like everything was right. And just, yeah, I just felt spiritually aligned going into that one. And like with my coach, like I definitely, um, I do my best to like, if, you know, someone compliments my physique and stuff, I simple thank you is fine, but I try to really shut out compliments or, you know, not in a bad way and not in a disrespectful way, but in a way that like, it's really easy to sort of assign your personal worth and value with how your physique looks or how your placings are, as we've discussed, you know? So I just really try to separate that and, you know, gain my sense of pride and satisfaction in my physique from the inside, from myself. And, but definitely like, I really, um, I feel like my coach really could tell last year too, that, you know, something had just clicked in me and that this, like everything was just falling into place in a way, I guess you could say. So, and that was um, one of my harder preps, like cardio wise. I'm generally, I generally am pretty lucky and don't have to grind as much with cardio, but I had a lot of plyos, a lot of hit, and it was hard and humbling. Um, It was a tough prep, but it just, it just felt right. No other way to describe it. What was your typical like diet and training split and do you do, I'm going to go over everything. So like walk me through what your maybe like off season versus 
your contest prep for cardio? Like, were you doing macros, meal plans? Like, what does it look like? That, oh, that was another big shift for me. So in my whole earlier stages of my fitness journey, I had been doing IIFYM, like flexible Uh dieting macros, um, but like clean macros, not like, let's see if I can fit in some fucking pop tarts. Right. Like, not that kind of, you know, (laughs) very clean though. I did do a lot of like, the macro friendly baking with like protein powder, like pea science. Like, I don't know if you remember the one carb waffle back in the day. Like if anyone listening remembers that, that was such a interesting trend. Yeah. (laughs) But anyway, so I had been doing that for years and it was pretty successful for me. And that's, um, something that I was really, you know, felt like, um, just game changing for anyone out, like not in competing, but just trying to get into fitness, understanding, how to sort of, um, alter your body composition, but eat foods you enjoy and, you know, in a way that you enjoy them. Um, but then when I joined the team, that's when I switched to meal plans. Um, and I knew that was going to be a big shift for me, but I felt like it would be a healthy shift. And that, um, sometimes I think if you're doing IIFYM, you can get a little food focused. If you're not, like just making meal plans out of your macros, you know, like, cause then you're thinking about like thinking about what you want to eat and who has time for that. (laughs) It it sounds a little odd, but it's like, you know, when you really are, you know, doing so many things, work, competing, blah, blah, blah. Like that's not, I mean, I don't want to have to think about food. So I had been on um, meal plans ever since, even through my uh, improvement seasons, the past few years, um, which I think, was really helpful for me. And then just, um, transitioning from my last, uh, competition to my improvement season, my coach had switched me to macros again. And I was like, Ooh, I I don't think I'm ready to go back, but, um, I did. And basically I just made a meal plan out of my macros and follow that. And, you know, sometimes change chicken for tilapia here and there, just, you know, so I can have the variety, but it's like, I'm not going to, spend time calculating numbers and like thinking about what I'm going to eat every day. Mm -mm. Um, Simple is better. That's uh, yeah. So at the beginning of my journey, I did the, if it fits your macros. And at a certain point I was like, who's trusting me with this decision? I was like, why? I like, I know I'm not eating the right things. I was like, I'm eating like grapes and cheese and like, I'm eating crackers. I'm like, there's no way this is right. I'm like, there's absolutely no way. So I was like, I don't want to think about it anymore. I don't Mm want to have to, I used to sit every Sunday. I would get my meals from my check-ins. I'd get my new macros for the week. Uh I'd have to calculate, you know, okay. I'd look at the grocery list. I'd online grocery it. I'd be like, okay, my grocery store is this, you know, I'm going to have, I'm going to go buy this box of crackers so I could have, you know, 10 crackers here for a stack. And then right. I'm gonna have, um, nine grapes and I'm going to have this. And just like every single week, it was different. Like my meals from week to week were different. So it was yeah. like, I never had the it's same so inefficient. It wasn't, it's was like, okay, you- how is your body going to respond consistently? If you're just like, let's eat this and not- then let's eat yeah. that. Um, but then meal plans was like, I have it memorized. It's similar stuff, just different exactly. quantity your body adjusts to it. It digests uh-huh. it really well. It doesn't guess mm-hmm. and you don't have to think, which I enjoy. It's exactly. like, just, just tell me what I need to do when I need to do it. And I'll do it. That's great for me. Yeah. To our earlier question of like, how do we do it all? How do you balance yeah. everything? Automate every decision as much yeah. as you can. Yeah. If you can automate food, do that. Like, yeah. I mean, and I know um, some people can successfully do IIFYM for prep. Yes. And like, that's, um, that's wonderful. Like power to you. If it helps you to, you know, mentally feel like, Oh, I am in control of the food I'm eating. You know, I get that. And I know, you know, that works better for some of my clients, but I do think there's definitely a point where it's like, even if you are IIFM, you should be clean and consistent for, you know, for that reason of like tracking, you know, how your body is responding to things. Like if you're always doing a different carb source, you're not going to know. And then you're not going to be prepared to carve up for the stage or excuse me, like if you need to carve load, like leading, you know, into peak week and things like that, it's really like everything you do is data. And if there are all these variables, you're not able to track anything. If you're, you know, eating your meals at all different times and not, uh, or, and then taking your check-ins at all different times, like you need to keep everything consistent, like eat the same foods, 
find how your body responds. And that's also part of the beauty of the journey of competing. It's you're not just, you know, learning your body in terms of like training and cardio and stuff. It's also, you know, the food choices for me. Um, one thing, I, one challenge I work around is I have so many food allergies and intolerances and things like that. And some of them we hadn't even realized. So like um, potatoes, I love potatoes, but, and I'm, I wouldn't say I have a sensitivity or anything, but um, my body definitely doesn't digest them as well. So it's like, if I'm carving up, it's gotta be like Jasmine rice, you know, something clean and simple like that versus, yeah. Yeah. I got, so I got there's blood so work many little too. nuances. You know? And I got the same thing. I got blood work this year for the first time because mm-hmm. I've always been very sensitive and I've known this mm-hmm. for like lotions mm-hmm. and products and foods. I'm very sensitive mm-hmm. to certain things. So I already eat pretty plain. So I got a food sensitivity t- test and there was just some of the things that I was hy- like hyper sensitive to. Those are all things in the past that I was using for like carbs up, like mm-hmm. coconut came up as a huge one. I was using coconut oil. Oh, wow and uh-huh. like sweet potatoes as carb uh-huh. sources going into like a peak week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was a super high one. Oh my uh, gosh. Yeah. Lemon randomly, you know, I would mm-hmm. do like lemon waters just cause uh-huh. I would, like, or just like put lemon on your chicken or mm-hmm. like just random things that I was eating a ton of that I had no yeah. idea. Cod, cod flag. Oh, me. that's one for me too. <laughs> uh, yeah. So my peak weeks were like lettuce, cod, coconut oil and sweet potatoes. So during those weeks, like of going into yeah. peak, those are all like my top highest sensitivities. So yeah. my, I look back and like, I was struggling with acne so hard then. And it was just kind of like, I think all of that hormonal and stress, but it was like, yeah. you're, I was shoving myself full of foods that were healthy, but they weren't working for myself. And so now I know better. It's exactly. like, I'm not going to do that, but um, it's something that you do have to learn. And it's like trial and error. It's like, okay, last time, you know, what carb source did we use to peak? Mm-hmm. What did it work for you? And then mm-hmm. you can replicate it. Cause when you find something exactly. that works, like don't change it, like don't change yeah. it. Yeah. I totally the same way. And it's like, even if you're, you know, you have a food sensitivity, it's not a full blown allergy. No. It's just a minor sensitivity and it can still, you know, be unnoticed by you and I, but, um, it, it shows up in subtle ways that, you know, only people with the trained eye would see like slight water retention and things like that, that, you know, like you can, um, put compete, uh, bikini competitor, like check-in photos side by side and like the untrained eye, like wouldn't see the differences, but someone who's been competing or a coach would be like this, that, and that, like your shoulders are fully here. And it's like all these things that like, someone's like, they're the same, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's really funny to compare, but, um, the food is such a, such an important component of it that people just don't even realize. And, um, you know, misconceptions about what's healthy and what's not. And, you know, it's also very individualistic too. Yeah. I agree with that too. Um, how is your reverse sites? How do you deal with that? Have you been good? Have you ever binged before? Um, for the most part, reverse dieting, I will, knock on wood, like it's all, it hasn't been nearly as hard for me as I, you know, see, um, and vicariously experience like through other people. Um, I've had, I think my first one was my worst or the reverse diet was actually fine on my first time. I was very slow and very careful, but, um, like I had a really rough, like that immediate post-show, like, Oh, eat all the treats. Mm -hmm." And that was the, um, I think that was the only time that I did that that, um, I was just like, never again, like, oh God, that was, you know, I think everyone has at least one that they're like, definitely went a little overboard. I had Um, like five, but I like every single one, every single one, I swear to you, I got like two, three grocery sacks of like cookies and like all these different things. And I just, I just didn't believe I was like, I worked so hard. I was like, there's no way one night is going to like destroy your progress. I was like, there's uh-huh. no way. I was like, there's no way. I was like, even if I ate, you know, 10,000 calories in a sitting, it's like, that can't ruin my progress. I'm lean, you know? And it's no, it's not that way. It's like you're hypersensitive post-show. So the second mm-hmm. you even sniff a cookie, it's like you gain a pound. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. So true. Yeah. But I just, I also like, 
I don't have much. I used to have a crazy sweet tooth. Like God, it was really bad, but I don't like, I don't, I generally don't experience cravings until just like peak week or like the last few weeks of a prep. Like when I'm really depleted, that's when I start thinking about treats and stuff. And also like, um, you know, whoever I'm competing with, they're usually a lot of, you know, it's very normal. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Like planning your post-show meal, like, oh, planning, like, cause a lot of time, you know, you're traveling, you're going to another state for a show. It's like, yeah. And you deserve to celebrate. And there, so there's nothing wrong with, you know, packing a post-show treat or like planning your dinner or whatever it's going to be. But it's just like, especially if I'm going with a group of friends or whatever, and everyone's like, you know, it becomes such a conversational topic. And I'm just like, get that like away from me. Like, I don't like, yeah. that's not why I'm competing. Like I could care less. Like I, there's many times I've just like eaten my tilapia after a show because I'm freaking hungry and thirsty and just want something that's going to feel good and digest well. Yeah. I don't want to, you know, I'm not used to eating in the middle of the night. Like, and you know, you get out of finals, it's late as heck. Yeah. Like, I don't want to be eating a bunch of crap and then waking up and feeling like shit in the morning. So exactly. um, and but- I think that's a good, it's a lesson learned. Mm-hmm. I spent an entire year planning my post-show meal in, oh, 20, in 2020 because I started prep in January, but then COVID mm-hmm. happened, pushed the show back and didn't get on stage till like September ish, I think. So, and then it was I mean, that yeah. was just stupid, but I had already picked out the restaurant. I'd had mm-hmm. already ordered like months ahead I'm talking like six or seven months yeah. ahead I had cookies stored in my fridge for like six months straight and that is just mentally not mm-hmm. good it's like a heroin addict has a big fat bag of heroin in his house that yeah I'm gonna just yeah. not ha- I'm gonna not think about it for the next year and that's how I mm-hmm. felt about cookies so it was just like just don't have it in your house don't think about exactly. it right now it's like I'm not even if I'm competing I'm not even going to look for restaurants until after my competition that night, depending on how Mm -hmm. I feel Yeah. at that time. It's like, okay, I don't know what time it's going to be. I don't know what time we're getting out when things are open. Um, Mm -hmm. If I'm going to be tired, do I want to shower? Do I want to sleep? Do I actually want to go out? And I would, that's what I like, what I recommend is like, don't even, I mean, maybe if you're going with a big group, yeah, plan where you Mm -hmm. guys can meet up and stuff like that. But if it's just not that important, like have brunch mm-hmm. the next day or like wait exactly. until you fly home and go to your mm-hmm. favorite home restaurant. Like later yeah. that week. I totally, yeah, I totally feel the same way, but it is so common to like, I know it's for really bad to like fill their freezer with cookies leading up to a show. Like, and there, you know, there's yeah. um, that whole cookie company thing. Like there's so many of them now it's very popular, but for me, like sort of my own guidelines, I don't want to say rules or guidelines really because yeah. it's not but it's just like my sort of thought process is like I don't need to bring anything I don't need to buy anything in advance because then I'm committing myself to have that or like even if you know I finished the show and I brought a candy bar maybe I don't really feel like it but I'm going to think I do because I have it exactly and so like I have some friends who really struggle with that and you know we'll be you know getting our we get to our destination we're competing in Arizona or something we're getting our waters and things like that and then everyone's like trying to get their post-show treats and I'm like here's my thought process and they're like okay maybe you're right okay maybe you're right and I'm like yeah I mean I if I feel like I want this packet of nut butter tomorrow I will come back and buy this exactly packet of nut butter tomorrow but if you you know out of sight out of mind so I don't want to like, if you buy it lunch. you will eat it I will guarantee that yeah. you're not just going to be like, oh, this king size candy bar I just purchased. I'm just going to leave it here or just like retake it in my checked luggage. It's like, no, mm-hmm. you're going to rip open yeah. and destroy it in five seconds, regardless if you're hungry or mm-hmm. want to or not. Like you're yeah. just going to eat it because it's there and it's convenient. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. If you have your meal prep instead, you're just going to eat it because it's there. You don't want to waste it, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's just making that decision. And it is, it is a learned thing. I think everyone yeah. sees other people do it and they feel like, oh, well, mm-hmm. I need to do that too. And no, it's, it's so it needs, yeah. I think we the, the seasoned competitors have made the mistake. So we'll let, we'll let the newbies enjoy it. But just like, if yeah. you go out to dinner, maybe have dessert there. If you feel like mm-hmm. it, it don't, yeah. 
don't bring it. Just don't bring it. And let, I mean, yeah, just don't bring it. Just, just don't, don't bring, bring it. it. it and just, I also, I'm just like, I know whoever, whoever's there is going to have stuff. Like oh, if I yeah. really feel like I want sweets, like, yeah, all my friends are the ones who bought like 20 cookies and, yes. you know, there are other, and all of a sudden, you know, you, at national shows, you know how people are a little more like to themselves and a little more catty. Still, after the fact, that's when everyone's like, have my donuts, have my, and I'm just like, yeah, like. Yeah. They're sabotaging you. If you see right? a girl backstage and she's like, here, have some cookies and donuts. It's like, she's sabotaging you. Exactly. She's not eating them for a reason because she's going to go compete in a few months and you're going to eat yeah. them. And you think that she ate them, but she did not mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it just depends on like, what are your priorities? If you just want to have fun and you want to eat yourself into a coma and w waste all your hard work in a matter yeah. of like a couple of hours, then that is your personal choice. If mm -hmm. you want to be competitive long-term, like I, and even in my, my off season, I don't eat bit like big dessert creations and I don't mm -hmm. eat that kind of stuff normally. So I was like, why, why does that make sense when you are so depleted and stuff like why would you want that like how would that sugar it was like that sugar that dairy that chocolate I haven't had in months my yeah. poor stomach is gonna be like alarms going off like this exactly. is not okay like what's happening uh, another another tip if like if you really have a hard time holding yourself accountable like after a show schedule a photo shoot the next day yes. you will not you will not fuck up because you're not gonna want to go with a pregnant like right. ninja like, yes yes I, I yep I agree with accountability you. do what you gotta do yeah well okay so yeah. for training intensity um do you feel like you are lifting heavy? Are you someone that trains six days a week? Do you train seven days a week? What does your split look like? Um, it's generally always like a six day a week split and then just trying to stay active on my seventh day, especially since like I work a desk job. I know that I should, you know, try to prioritize extra movement if it's like a rest day. Um, and I love lifting heavy. I always have like, I really, you know, am passionate about like pushing myself in that way. So that's something that also has like really helped me with my reverse and transitioning from, you know, prep to improvement season is like setting strength goals and, you know, focusing on getting stronger. But I've also, you know, over time you get to know your body and like which exercises work better for you and, you know, um, this and that. And like, I've also, I have, um, a lot of previous injuries that I'm working around. So I have a lot of muscle imbalances and it's like a lot of bilateral movements. Like you can see, like I look crooked. So I do a lot of unilateral work and just, I think, you know, to my point, like over time, you know, kind of what works best for your body, what doesn't yeah. like there are simple things like the flag dumbbell deadlifts. I can't really do those. And that sounds like a pretty basic movement, but I just, you know, certain things I like to revisit, like, let's see if I can work on my form for this. But most importantly, at this point, like when you have this many years of lifting under your belt, focus on what, you know, works and excel at that, you know, find different strategies, whether, you know, it's drop sets or failure or, you know, different rep schemes, tempo, you know, because over time, like you don't get that same beginner gains. Like you really have to take it up a notch to get your body there. And, you know, to that point. So it's like in many, many lifts, I do prefer lifting heavy um, versus like hypertrophy rep ranges. Like, but there are certain things, for example, I love sumo deadlifts, right? But if I go heavy, my quads grow. Yeah. Um, so I'm at the point where I'm realizing like, as much as I would love to keep adding weight, like I'm going to train for my goals and not train for my ego mm -hmm. <laughs> and just kind of, you know, set the bar there. Yeah. 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 That's one thing too, that I used to think I saw all of these influencers doing these like real unique things that I'm like, mm -hmm. Oh, I want to try that. I want to try that. I want to try that. Yeah. But tried and true stick with what your works. Like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. My routine exactly. is like very similar. I mean, if I get bored, like instead of doing lying hamstring curls, maybe I do seated, 
you know, uh-huh. or, or maybe you throw in an extra drop set or, or a single mm-hmm. sink, like do laying, but do single leg instead of double mm-hmm. or something like that. But like, for the most part, I want it to be the exact same. I want to progress. I want to see, okay, mm-hmm. am I able to contract harder? Or am I going to squeeze harder? Or maybe I'm going up in weight. Like the focus is so mm-hmm. different, but the lifts have been the same. And so once I really found like what lifts work, I don't like to change. I mean, I'll change it up as yeah. well as fit, but you know, until mm-hmm. in this sport specifically, when you're trying to fit, focus on like symmetry and balance until the judges mm-hmm. say, you know, you're big enough or you're symmetrical, like there's no, there's not a reason to keep changing in between, you know, mm-hmm. your, your, your prep. So it's like from one show to the next, you get your feedback. And then I feel like that's a great time of, Oh, my feedback was shoulders or, Oh, my feedback was upper glutes. And then you add in more of those things targeted towards this mm-hmm. symmetrical balance that you need to get toward. And at a certain yeah. point, like you max out in bikini, like you can't mm-hmm. get bigger always. Yeah. Like you have to get symmetrical or so, I mean, <laughs> yeah. so it's That's- not, it's not about lifting heavy. It's never been about lifting heavy. If it was, mm-hmm. you would do a powerlifting meet on we stage. Would keep- exactly like, yeah no one I, no one knows everyone's prs we don't compete against that like no it doesn't matter like someone could be lifting five pounds for shoulder press and someone could be doing 65 pounds for shoulder mm-hmm. press and they could look at the exact same you don't know like mm-hmm. one girl could win but it doesn't matter it's just more about like what works for your body and every single exactly. body and training is different and i always um have that in mind like for example one of the um I have BB pros who I really admire is Phoebe Hagen and her yeah. upper body is just, she is built. She's freaking beautiful. I, um, yeah. one of my, um, shows in 2019, um, she was in the same show, like, you know, how they often have like NPC and yeah. IFBB in tandem. Yeah. And that was her, the first time she won a pro show. And I was just, I was floored, but also like learning more about her training and whatnot. Like she's had to atrophy her shoulders. And like, um, I remember, you know, hearing about her split for a while and like she would do like five pound lateral raises um just like three sets twice a week and like I don't think she would do anything else for her shoulders don't don't quote me not verbatim it was something like that something very minimal and I was just like yeah. oh god I would I would hate that and so in some ways even though like I think my biggest insecurity is always like going to it always goes back to me feeling like, oh, I'm too small. Like I don't have enough muscle. Blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, I lost all my muscle in 2018. I have no shoulders, blah, blah, blah. And so like, for me, I know those are like the limiting beliefs that pop up for me always. And so it's like, I'm always, you know, training really hard and, you know, working on those goals. But on the other side of the coin, I think, you know what, how would I feel if my feedback was that I was too big? I'd be more, I'd be way more upset because I, the reason I got into this sport in the first place was for my love of lifting. Didn't have to do anything with like looks, aesthetics or anything like sparkly bikinis, no care. Like it was about my love for training. And so if I, I thought, okay, what if like, they're like, no, your glutes are too big or your shoulders or this or that. And like, I had to, I would hate that. Like I am different. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the judges to tell me I'm too big because then I know I made it. For a specific muscle group or? Yes. For everywhere. General uh, for everything. Well, for my glutes, I would love it if they're like your glutes are too, but my shoulders, cause I work really hard to get them bigger. I feel like they're Uh pretty, like I'm getting close to being done training shoulders for a while. Mm -hmm. And that makes me very excited because then I can prioritize build like that time I can utilize to build my other muscles. Does that make sense? Like, and then it's, yeah. not, it's not like I have to train harder, but it's more strategic. And like, I yes. want to get to the point where it's like, I I've never been big enough. Like I've never been big enough everywhere. I've never had the, mm-hmm. like, I've always had, you know, hamstrings, glutes, shoulders. And now it was, yeah you know, conditioning and then glutes, conditioning and then glutes and glutes. And so it's like, I'm seeing like, we're getting so close. Like I want to get to the point where they're like, you're too, like you're capped. Like, I want that. Yeah. No, I'm like, I just got to maintain. Yeah. No, I hold on steady. Well, so, um, I, yeah, I feel the same way. It's also like a sign, like what I'm there. Yeah. Like like, you did it. Like, 
like I like I imagine confetti pops everywhere and it's like right? it's, like yeah and it's just like a parade and it's my that's what's gonna happen in my mind and when she like Sandy's like looks you in the eye and she's like yeah you're good on here and there and I'm like yeah right. yeah like I mean I just feel like at a certain point like you you I don't know it's like you earn not to work out because you worked out so hard yes it's, so oh, I, I get that. Yeah. So I think I, that's what I'm looking at. Um, it, so my first show with my team, Handsome Muscle in 2019, that was the first time I got first place in a class. It was in the novice division though. Uh -huh. And that, um, the first time I got first place in the open class was in 2020. Um, and my feedback, like my glutes were there, they were perfect. And just to bring in my upper body. And I was like, did you say, did you see my glutes were there? You said, I don't have to grow. What? Yes. Yes. It's such a good so, feeling. Yeah. But then it was really weird because then my coach trained or uh, changed my training split and like, um, moved, I think she had my shoulders like four times a week or something. And then I was down to twice a week for glutes and she put like weight limits on certain lifts. And I was like, wait, what? Like, I thought you were saying 225 pounds was like the least amount to hip thrust. You're saying I can't hip thrust more than that. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in some ways I was like, like, wow, like I had that validation that like I got my physique where it needed to be. And, and then also, you know, with my feedback from, you know, coming close to my pro card last year, I was like, it was just really surreal to be like, well, I'm basically there. There's just some fine, like very small tweaks. But, um, and then to your point also of like being strategic, that's when I realized because like, I, you know, as a coach and also just because I'm kind of a nerd who loves to read and research, like I spent years like researching and studying bodybuilding science and like, I still do, but just definitely not to the extent that I used to. Um, even a few years ago, I was, you know, very, very, very nerdy about it. Um, like I studied the hell out of like Brett Contreras work and all these different, you know, studies and stuff and like really found that connection with my glutes and found those exercises that work and like stopped wasting my time trying to do ones that I just didn't work for my body because yeah. like, well, no, this is like what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to do this kind of deadlift and that, but it's like, no, it's, you know, finding what works for you. And so then, you know, I had that epiphany or turning point where I was like, okay, I need to take this same level of like mental intensity and apply it to the upper body because that's where you know, I like broke my right arm, I've broken wrists and like, like straight through the ulna, like all the clean fully breaks. So it's like, there are some things like I, you know, I will never fully recover from these and I will always have to, you know, modify and adapt training. But that was the point where I was like, okay, I really need to take the same focus to figure out how to work around these plateaus and muscle imbalances, upper body. And I mean, it works. I, grew an upper body and still got work to do, but it's just like, yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, we're opposite. So I've been, I've been trying to grow my glutes since I was a little, little competitor. I've been trying to get that, that little shelf booty, you know, where just yeah. little, that little upper shelf. And the, then the, the upper nice, shelf is the hardest part. Oh my gosh. Why is it so challenging? Like, I feel yeah. like as I'm a tall athlete. So like, I feel like my glutes are longer. So mm. it's taking in my head, it's taking a long time because it's like, it's got to round out down here and then yeah. it gets all the way up there. Is it weird? I'm like, I'm trying to picture your butt right now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like I mean, remember, like, like so I life. came, like I was a pancake, butt. I was oh. like right there. Just oh, so, okay. it, you know, Same and so shoulders wise, like too, like I was just like little, little teeny tiny arms. And so now I'm like very proud yeah. of my like upper body progress. It's just taking time away from the focus from upper for the lower to grow. And I'm sure your lower is good. So now you got to have that time yeah. to focus on your yeah. upper. Yeah. And definitely, you know, checking that ego at the door when it's like, it, you know, you don't need to be pushing the heaviest weight for everything all the time. That's not strategy. No. That, being a bulldozer <laughs> it is yeah and I mean some of the little exercises like sometimes it's just like putting in the reps to feel that pump and getting yeah. like, you know this sometimes you do like the light weight but high reps those burn mm -hmm. more than the heavy stuff yeah 
Awesome. So, well, um, we're getting close to like the end of this. Um, what is your, like, what is your best advice for someone who wants to just get into fitness in general, not even bodybuilding, not even bodybuilding. Um, I would say someone who's trying to start a new fitness journey or rekindle their love for fitness is kind of like I was saying earlier, take it slow, um, baby steps, start small, build upon many wins and keep up the progress, but also experiment with different types of physical activity. Because I think a lot of us, you know, based on our friend groups, our social circles, or, you know, whatever echo chamber we happen to fall in in Instagram, whatever we see on social media or media in general, like, we'll think we'll have to do things a certain way or like, oh, because, you know, this is not a real example, but like, oh, running a marathon running is super trendy right now. So people will go gravitate to whatever, you know, the trends are, um, or, you know, follow whatever their friends are doing. And kind of like what we were saying earlier about our youth, like if it's not something that really aligns with who you are, it's something you're interested in, you're not going to persevere and be gritty and keep up with it. So I, I think that's one of the most important things for someone getting into fitness is like experiment, hike, take dance classes, take like cycling classes, you know, try bodybuilding, try like YouTube workouts, like, you know, just experiment and find things that work for you, but also have, you know, that context that it's like starting something new and difficult. Like you, maybe you won't love it right away. And you, you, you will have to push through things you don't like, but you know, you don't need to be forcing yourself to go into some other box that isn't meant for you. I like that a lot. Okay. So on the other side of the coin, so this is to other athletes like us who are trying to get to the amazing pro card and they're working the national circuit, or maybe they're going to step on national stage for the first time. What is your advice to someone who's wanting to become a pro athlete? Um, be patient as hell, as we discussed earlier on this episode, like, you know, you could be doing in the top five, like 10 national shows and you're not there yet. Be patient. Your time is going to come. If it's meant for you, you just have to keep showing up. Um, be humble and take the feedback. Um, leave your ego at the door and train for your goals. Don't train for your ego. Don't train for Instagram. Don't train, you know. Um, yeah, it's really just about being patient. Um, and then also I would say, um, this is probably when you might not have heard as much as like, um, really find two parts to this, I guess, like find the coach that you really connect with. Um, yeah. but also don't coach pop because I've also seen that too. And like, like, oh, I didn't do as well at this show. So I'm going to change coaches. And it's like, that could have nothing to do with it. Maybe it's your fault. Maybe it's no one's fault. It could be anything, but part, like if you're always with a different coach, you won't progress because they're going to, someone new is going to have to keep learning your body time and time again. Mm -hmm. You aren't going to make any progress, but also, you know, people will. And then to that first point of like finding the coach that's right for you, don't join some team because they're the big team that sponsors every show that they're the title sponsor, like leave the politics out of it and leave the clout out of it. And it's really about finding, you know, what works for you. For example, like my coach, she's tough love. She's a hard ass. She will yell at you. And that's what I need. I like that. That's that style works for me. Doesn't work for everyone. Some people, you know, need someone gentle handholding. There's there's so many coaches out there. There's someone that's right for you. (laughs) I agree with that point. 100%. You have to give a coach a chance to like to improve with you because it's like you said, it's not always the coach's fault. I I never, ever blame my coach for a placing. I think that is dumb. I think that is dumb. I mean, there are bad coaches out there that, yeah, maybe the way they peaked you wasn't perfect, but at the Uh end of the day, you're the one executing it. You know, you Mm -hmm. guys are got, you got to communicate if a plan isn't working, if you don't say anything and speak up. So like when you find a coach, like it's really important that you don't just say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. It's 
they need feedback too. So I think that's something I used to not do at the beginning. I used to just like follow blindly, but now Mm -hmm. I'll push back and be like, I don't think that's what I think we should do. Or can you explain why I was thinking more of this, or Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it this, like, is that okay if I do this? Or like, what do you Mm -hmm. think we incorporate some of this? Or I feel this exercise more, I'd like to do this or that. And having Uh that, it's a partnership. It's not just a- Oh, 100%. It, Cause I mean, you're hiring them. So at the end of the day, they're working for you. It's not mm-hmm. the other way around and just mm-hmm. never for, never forget that of like, you are paying them. Yeah. They, they, you're paying them to give you, it's kind of like a mentorship more than like a coaching relationship. They're trying to make mm-hmm. you be your best as an athlete overall and mm-hmm. get this, this goal. So I, I really agree with some of those points that you, you said, and it, it's really important for new competitors. Cause it's just. Mm-hmm. It's so common. Oh, well, this year I'm doing this team. This year I'm doing that team. Yeah. It's like, okay, good luck. It's, it's not doing you any favors. No, it's spinning not. your wheels. It's not. Yeah. But okay, so final question. Well, a couple of final questions. So if you could pick between cupcakes and protein shakes, which one would you be and why? Like eating a cupcake versus drinking a protein shake? Yeah. Okay. Um. Oh, oh gosh. I should have known because this is a standard question. Yeah. Damn it. Um, I'm not really like a protein powder person anymore and I'm not a sweets person. Oh, you're so, in betweener. Yeah, I guess. Is that an option? Can sure. I be an in betweener? Okay, yeah. I'll be an in betweener. But if I had to pick, I guess I would go protein. Okay. And what kind of protein powder do you use? Um, Ambrosia Planta Protein. I can't do whey Dang. and they have some really good, um, vegan protein. Oh, nice. I love vegan protein. I saw yeah. it was on my, it was on my sensitivity list. So, oh, uh, yeah. yeah. so a lot of people are that way as well. Is there anything yeah. that we didn't get to talk about that you wish I would have asked you? Oh my God. So many things probably. Um, okay. <laughs> maybe we'll save it for another episode. Yeah, but, for sure. Uh, yeah. I feel like, um, some context I would love to share at some point is like, really um why I started competing in the yeah. first place like aside from that outside encouragement um and what else I don't know something yeah, expand like, on that for real quick about the end so like why did you start competing and what keeps you in the sport um well as I mentioned before like it really had nothing to do with aesthetics but it, and it you know started with like wanting to challenge myself and see if I could take it to that level but in terms of like bodybuilding like before competing, I fell in love with it as a sense of like truly self empowerment. Um, I was in a really dark place. And when I started getting consistent, really consistent with bodybuilding, I was in um, an abusive relationship. I was with an abusive boyfriend and it was uh, the second time Um, I had been with one prior that ended in a restraining order. And then I like, it just became even darker for me because I sort of, I don't mean to, you know, take this in a bad direction all of a sudden. No, I know it's okay. Going into that second one. And, you know, I was in there for almost a couple of years as well. And I was so much harder on myself for that. Cause I was like, Kylie, like you went through this before and like, how could you let yourself do, you know, get into this again? How did you not see the signs? Like I was so hard on myself. I was hating on myself so much. And like, bodybuilding and being in the gym like was truly like a saving grace for me and like it was you know to take care of myself and I, you know while I was still in that relationship he was really controlling and you know tried to keep me out of the gym he you know tried to not let me go where it only go if he could be there and watch me and like literally it was some very next level control like I was only allowed to wear basketball shorts I couldn't wear leggings because people would look at my butt it was just I could go on it was just yeah scary and inhumane this person that I was with but um so for me like and I remember when I started you know going more alone and wearing like actual gym wear like you can't be like squatting and deadlifting in basketball shirts like what the hell like no so you know so I I would listen to like sad music or things like um you know, um, what is that really annoying voice guy? Like Sean Mendez, like treat you better. And I'd be like in the gym, like listening to these things, like, like, just like, I like telling myself I was training the whole time. And I was like, 
I can get out of this. Like, I, like, I'm stronger. I, like, I'm getting stronger. And, you know, this isn't the end for me. I'm somehow, I'm going to be free someday. And like, so for me, bodybuilding was really like, that's how I finally like got the courage and internal strength to like stand up for myself and like cut things off for real and just step into my power. I mean, you know, going back even further, the reason I started lifting in the first place is because I wanted to be physically stronger and be able to like physically stand up for myself and like fights and things like that. And it's just like, I don't know, it's, it's such a journey. It's like, you know, thinking back to these things and like from where I started and where I came from. And, you know, a lot of people really, you know, get in the gym or compete because they want to change the way they look, but I wanted to change the way I felt on the inside. And that like, whenever I'm discouraged or, you know, in a tough training session or like I'm fucking starving and I have this cardio to do, like I go back there mentally and think like, this is my why, like, I'm here to be a stronger me. (laughs) Oh my gosh. That's so amazing. Thank you. I mean, I really appreciate you being so like real and honest. And like, that's why I love this sport too, because like, if you're in it for the wrong reasons, you're going to get weeded out quickly. And so those of us that decide that there is a why there's a deeper why. So it is not just about the aesthetics, which is great. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to keep you in here long-term and there's nothing wrong with wanting to get strong and look good too. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, like body building is, it's more so for, I feel the same way. It's, it's, it's an internal, it's an internal mm-hmm. change. The biggest change that you go through in your fitness journey is mental and spiritual mm-hmm. because you become your true best self. And Mm -hmm. you cannot become that way until you do it yourself. (laughs) Like until you, you really, you really It starts on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. You take a goal of, of being on the stage and then you accomplish it. And then you did it not once, not twice. You personally did it 15, 16 times, like 17 times. I mean, so you kept on doing it and it's just really inspiring to me that like, you're able to be kind of on top now and like, you're so close to getting the pro card. So I know that it's coming for you. I'm hoping this year. Thank you. I really it's do. Same to you. Same yes. To you. Well, definitely. Yeah. Hopefully I run into you backstage somewhere yeah. soon. And, um, I know I wish you nothing but success because you've, you've worked so hard up into this point. And that's, I think it's your hard work and worth ethic. There's no reason in my mind or no doubt in my mind that you won't get everything that your heart desires. And so thank you for coming oh. on. I know I was hosting me. Yeah. Like it just, this is why we do it. You know, it's like, I love, I love the sport. I love who you meet. And I love the reason why behind the sport. It's just, it's so nice because everyone's out here, you know, dealing with different things. And you might say, Oh, I wish I could do this. I wish I could do that. You might see girls on Instagram and I'll never look like that. I'll never, it's like, yes, if you keep thinking that way, you won't. You have exactly. to believe deep down that it is possible. And, um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're just a testament to, you know, believing in yourself and anything is possible if you just like really stick to it and, you know, all of your different goals and mindset. So I'm excited to have this episode come out. So this should be next Wednesday or this upcoming Wednesday. Oh, so soon. Yes. I don't like to I mean, wait. I hate waiting yeah. for episodes. Like when it's record, I see people recording mm-hmm. episodes and then it like comes up like two months later. I hate that. I hate. Oh waiting. my gosh. Yeah, you know so- what? Well, I, I produce a podcast I have for a couple of years and we'll usually have like, I have, you know, a year ahead planned out. And a lot of the time, I batch record and have things, you know, yeah. several months in advance. So yeah. What kind of podcast like, do you run? Um, it's for, it's for my work. Okay. Um, so that's part of, yeah. So I'm project managing this uh, SVCF philanthropy now is the podcast. Oh, but, nice. Yeah. Okay. And so finally, <laughs> if our listeners would like to tag you on Instagram or just like reach out to you after, where can they find you? Um, oh, it is. On this little background, there's Kylie Pearl Fitness. You can find me there. Thank you again, Savannah, for hosting me. This was such a joy um, to chat with you and get to know you and share more about my journey. Not as nerve wracking as I thought. It's just a conversation, you guys. So if you're listening to this. Yeah, I mean, I know. I I mean, but you know yourself best. So and you reached out to me on Instagram. So 
just if you're listening to this, I always <laughs> want people that are willing to share their story to reach out to me and get on an episode because I think, you know, you're listening to the podcast, so you know what to expect. And like, if you're willing to put yourself out there, like, you know, it's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to end the episode here. Let me pause this.